morning. Welcome back to Good News Open House. Uh, this is a series of sermons explaining why we do what we do and how we do it. At least that's what we're trying to do. So if you're coming to Good News for the first time today, or this is the first time that you've been here all year, I would encourage you to check out the church's website, go back and listen and watch this series that we have covered so far. Today is part five, and the focus is on missions. And I think for the vast majority of people, whether you are inside the church or outside of the church, when you hear the word mission, that you kind of think, or missionary, you kind of think of traveling around some far place, or that it's like an extra special type of Christian, people who pack up all their belongings and they move to some foreign country on the other side of the world for the purpose of sharing the gospel. And that is partly correct, but missions is so much more than just that. When it comes to missions and being a missionary, the Bible teaches that everyone who professes to be a Christian, that everyone who professes trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, to everyone who has been saved by grace, to everyone who has admitted and confessed sin and is counting on Jesus to forgive them of their sins, everyone who has done that, the Bible declares such a person to be a missionary and on a mission. That's what the Bible teaches. And this mission is not impossible. Mission Impossible might be a good name for a movie, but that is not the mindset of God nor his people when it comes to reaching out and sharing the gospel with people who don't know God yet. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is not the way Jesus talks to his followers. Followers of Jesus don't have the option of accepting this or not accepting. This is our mission. If you are a Christian, your mission is to follow Christ's call, share the gospel with a lost world using his wisdom, his strength. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this verse here, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's Jesus giving Christians their marching orders of the mission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Anyone know what these verses are commonly called? The Great Commission. Great Commission. That's correct. And this commission that Jesus spoke nearly 2,000 years ago is just as applicable today. Everyone who identifies as a follower of Christ has been called, has been commissioned, has been assigned to go and be a part of making more and better disciples of Jesus. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul is equipping and he's teaching Christians on, on how to live it's passages like this that affirm some, some of the ways that we talk around here, that every member is a minister. All Christians have ministries, and sometimes those ministries can differ one to another. But there is one ministry here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that Paul says all Christians have and all Christ Christians are responsible to fulfill. It's a ministry that is not optional. It's a ministry that can't be delegated to just some Christians, but that, in fact, it is for each and every individual Christian. Read along with me, starting here in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Here is a clear guideline on how Christians are to live. Christians have come to a faith conclusion that because Jesus had died for them, Christians no longer live for themselves, but instead they live for risen Jesus. That's Christianity. Now from verse 16. From now on then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now... We no longer know him in this way. Paul's life had been turned upside down, inside out, with the encounter that he experienced with Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was converted to Christianity. Paul appears to be saying 
that before his conversion, he viewed things, including Jesus and Jesus' life, from merely a human perspective. But his conversion, before his conversion, Paul viewed Christ as just a mere man. And his death was justified. It was a great penalty for such heresy. But after his conversion, Paul came to know Christ as the Son of God and the substitute for human sin. Paul's perception and perspective of Christ drastically changed. And so did his perception of other people as well. He no longer made evaluations of people merely based on their outward appearance. He no longer valued the external features that we see happening all over our world today. Physique, physical appearance, reputation, wealth, influence, popularity. Paul didn't look at people like that anymore. Because now he understands that everyone can be forgiven from their sins and transformed through faith in Christ. And that has become his primary concern. He looks at people. He watches people. He studies people. Is this person in Christ or out of Christ? And in verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. Everything is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and watch this, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There it is. Every Christian has the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? Often, the Bible is so good that if we just keep reading, it will explain itself. And that's exactly what happens here. Keep reading, verse 19. It tells us, it explains us what the ministry of reconciliation is. That is, the ministry of reconciliation is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And, watch it, He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The ministry of reconciliation is missions. It's sharing the gospel with people who don't know God yet. So every Christian at Good News and throughout the entire world, we are members of Team Jesus. And every member has been given the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul calls us ambassadors, an ambassador for Christ. And we plead, we make an emotional appeal. That's what the word plead means here. We emotionally plead. We beg, we beseech, we implore, we petition, we supplicate, we claim, we even argue on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. And it is certain that God is appealing through us. Go team Jesus. And to reconcile means to restore, to fix, to make right what is broken. And this is our mission, the ministry of reconciliation. We do the pleading, and God does the saving. Now, I I am not sure why God doesn't just use the same method that he used for Paul and his conversion to Christianity for everyone. It certainly would seem that if a a bright, blinding light and a voice from heaven calling your name to come to Christianity would work for everyone. That's what happened with Paul. But instead, God has appointed all Christians, and he calls them ambassadors to plead with people who don't know God yet And when it happens, verse 21 is astonishing. It tells us what it looks like. He, God, made the one Jesus, who did not know sin to be sin, for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 
what it means to be reconciled to God. The righteousness of God placed upon us in Christ. A person is restored to God. A person is fixed, having the righteous, righteousness of God because of the work of Jesus on the cross. And every Christian has the responsibility, has the ministry of reconciliation. Now, Good News Church is a simple church. Maybe you've heard that before. We, we don't have a lot of programs and events. However, the things that we do, we want everyone to do it. Sunday morning, it's so, so important. We want everyone to do it. Choose your flavor, 9.15 or 11. You guys seem to choose the 11. Pick one, pick both. Worship at one, serve in the other. We want everyone to worship together on Sunday mornings. Groups, Bible study groups, community groups, accountability groups. We want everyone to be committed and plugged into groups. They are biblical, and therefore that makes them important. Last week, serve. We want everyone to serve, both formally and informally. It's so important. If you missed last week, I highly recommend, go back and watch it. See what the Bible has to say about serving in these ways of formally and informally. And when it comes to missions, we hold the same position. We want everyone to be doing missions. And we really want to encourage everyone who can, to go on a mission trip that Good News Church supports and sponsors. Go to camp. You have flyers on your seats. There's a slide behind me, and there's a booth out front. Go to camp. Go to Royal Family Kids Camp. Go to Teen Reach Adventure Camp. Go to both. One of the ways that we try to fulfill this ministry of reconciliation here at Good News is by asking you to participate in camps. And now there's a very good chance that some of you are thinking, you mean you want me to go to camp and sacrifice my time and maybe even my vacation time? Yep. You mean you want me to go to camp where cell phones and computers are not allowed for a week. Yep. As a matter of fact, that is a great reason to go to camp. <laughs> you detox from devices. I took a picture last year of the cell phone table. Like, you do have them. There's a designated area for you. There must have been $40,000 worth of cell phones <laughs> on this table. You mean, go to camp hang out with children that I don't even know and might not even like you. I think I've experienced that. <laughs> yep. You mean go to camp and sleep in a bunk bed? Yep. You mean go to camp where there is one shower for eight to ten people? Yep. But you'll get three great meals of camp food and snacks every day. And there is inside plumbing. And most of the time, the AC works. But maybe, maybe, none of these should be the factors at all if deciding if you or I go to camp. Because ultimately, it is not about our comfort and our preferences. It is about the ministry of reconciliation and investing in the lives of children. And maybe, maybe for some time, you have been sensing God calling you, reaching out to you to not be in control of all the circumstances. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time, and God is tapping you and saying, hey, you are not going to be in charge of all these circumstances. Go do something that is hard. Go do something that you cannot control all the variables. And I promise you, if you go to camp, it will not go according to your plans. I ran more miles that week I went last year. But 
If the purpose it means that you learn to trust God for doing things, doing riskier things, many a camper has returned from camp and said, Camp changed my life. Camp strengthened my faith in Jesus. There's a short video of a camp worker. His name is Joel Santana. And I want you to watch it as he tells the impact that camp had on his life. Camp is, is a place when a kid can be loved. And I think it is, man, this is it in me. <laughs> I believe we're, we are so blessed um, in so many ways. I will never think of how many other people are in need of just love. And it's just the fact that we can listen, the fact, the fact that they can speak and they know somebody's listening to them. I was with another camper and he was looking at my watch and I asked him, hey, do you want to have it? And he said, yes, yes, let me have it. Um, he got my watch and he noticed it was like nine o'clock. And he told me, <clears throat> he told me, I wish I could add six more hours. I wish I could add six more hours to the day so I can spend more time with you. I took a deep breath <laughs> and I told me, hey, let's go ahead and do this. Keep my watch. Every time you see the time, you pray for me. And every time I see the time, I'll pray for you. And hopefully I'll see you again next year. I prayed for him and I told him, hey, man, I love you. And he said, I love you too. And I was thinking like, how can a kid can get to love us so quick? But God is love, man, and it's, it's nature. It's something that comes like very natural because it comes from God. And the fact that these kids can have someone who can love them and someone who can be loved by them, man, it makes my first year being the best, best experience I've ever had. With the time we have, the time we have, um, I mean, a week of a year to me probably doesn't cost any much as as the experience that these kids are having, and it, it is teaching me what am I doing with my time. Um, as a Christian, I just want to be more like Jesus every time, and it made me ask, am I being like Jesus? Am, am I am I acting like Jesus? Am I investing my time as Jesus did? And I think it is it is something that will remain in my heart, what will Jesus do and what am I doing to be more like him? And yeah, make me realize how much how much can we can we do with the time we have. Joel near the end of his interview, he asked two questions and it's in Attempting to answer those questions, how I want to end the sermon. Although we still have a ways to go, just let you know. His two questions, he asked, what am I doing with my time? And how much can we do with the time that we have? Both are excellent questions. Both are excellent questions to put an answer a story that came to my mind was the story of Queen Esther when she was informed by her cousin Mordecai over a very significant matter like life and death. And time was ticking away. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Old Testament book of the Bible, Esther, or not. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory and try to draw some parallels between Joel's testimony and Mordecai and Esther. The book of Esther, it's 10 chapters long. Most of you could probably read it in under an hour. It's the kind of book 
that is easy to read, easy to understand, and it is filled with nonstop action. Like drama, corruption, violence, power, greed, deception, manipulation, sex, good guys, bad guys, suspense, mystery, and all the more is found in the book of Esther. If ever Esther was to be made in a, to a movie, and, and actually I should say I found out this week that it had been made into a movie, uh, it was named A Night with the King. Um, I watched a little clip of it. I, I don't think the producers, I mean, they, 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 they did a, a great job of it. But I think if G movies start here and you read Esther the way it really plays out in the Bible, that its rating would be like way, 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 way over here. It is a scandalous book. And, and yet, to think, here it is in God's holy scripture. Uh, the book has four main characters. Obviously, Esther. She is a real living person in a real living place, in a place called Persia at that time. Today we would call that Iran. She's a Jewish orphan, and she was adopted by her cousin Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai is also a main character. Uh, he is a gatekeeper for the king. One of the most significant acts that he is recorded for about him in this book is that he foiled an assassination plan. He was doing his job at the gate, and he overheard two guys making a plan to kill the king. He made sure that the right people knew that they were going to kill the king, and he saved the king without even being recognized for it at first. So then, obviously, the king is also one of the main characters. He goes by the name of King Xerxes or King Ahasuerus uh, is how he's also known. Uh, he is, think like prideful, masculine king guy. That's how he kind of is described throughout it. Um, he did have a queen named Queen Vashti, but she got kicked out for not doing what he said and enter Esther. She becomes queen. Now, you just got to read it, but I'll, I'll just tell you, she basically becomes queen by winning a beauty pageant and having a great one-night stand with the king. All right, it's dicey, right? It's dicey. But how she became queen, I don't believe is important as why she became queen. Like, when all that was happening, I doubt she knew what was happening in chapter 4 that we're going to get to. And the fourth main character, he was a fellow by the name of Haman. Uh, every story has to have a villain, it seems, and he is the villain. He is a bad dude. He's not a good guy. He seems to be super, super prideful, super into himself, super egotistical. He's the kind of guy that even when he would overhear people's conversations like, hey man, you want to go hang out and have some food? Or, hey man, how you doing today? He'd hear hey man and think it was about him. Like, it hey, wasn't about him. But that's the way he seems to operate. He hated, capital H, Mordecai. And he hated the people like Mordecai. The reason he primarily hated Mordecai is because there was this rule made by the king that when Haman enters into your presence, you must bow down and worship Haman. And Mordecai said, I am not doing it. And he didn't. It stirred Haman so much to his core that he actually convinced the king to make another rule. King, there's a people amongst us that we must get rid of. The Jews. And the king signs the edict. It's a law. It's going to happen. It's going to happen on the 13th day of Adar, the 12th month. A bounty was placed on every head of every Jew to be destroyed, killed, annihilated, young and old, women and children, and plunder all of their possessions on this one single day. A massacre had been planned and approved, and now it is only a matter of time until this execution takes place. Except Esther doesn't know about it. Though she's the queen and though she's a Jew, she doesn't know about it until Mordecai gives her the news. And he tells her, you've got to go see the king immediately and get this stopped. And Esther's first response is, I can't. 
you have to have permission to go see the king. And I don't have permission. As a matter of fact, it's been 30 days since I've seen the king. They must have done king queen things really weird back then. But they, they did. And approaching the king could cost her her life. So that's the background when we come to now Esther chapter 4. Joel asked the questions, what am I doing with my time and how much can we do with the time that we have? Turn your Bibles to Esther chapter 4 and we pick up this story here in verse 13. Esther just told Mordecai that she couldn't go and Mordecai told the messengers to reply to Esther, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now I realize the scenarios of the Jews being executed, killed, and what we're talking about going to camp are not the same scenarios totally, but there are some very similar things here that we can link between both of them. And the first one is this. Time is of the essence. Time is urgent. This is not the time to be silent. One, there is no guarantee that Royal Family Kids Camp, Teen Reach Adventure Camp, will continue for years to come in the future. We don't know that. Time is now for this opportunity to love and to care for children who mostly only know hardship. And yes, I am making a direct appeal for camp this morning, but it goes without saying that we live in a culture as a whole. Pick where you want your ministry of reconciliation to be and do it. This is not the time to be silent with the gospel. There is so much darkness around us, so much hopelessness around us, so much brokenness, so much addiction, so much slavery, both by substance and human trafficking, so much hurt, so much emptiness, so much despair. I know I don't have to tell you this. I know you know it. We live it. And yet I'm going to say some things that are hard to hear. And it is easy sometimes for us to turn a little bit of a deaf ear. Suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States. It's the fourth leading cause of teenagers 15 to 19 years old. The 2020 estimates are in. People who planned a suicide was 3.2 million people. People who acted upon it was 1.2 million people. People. And it is estimated that 46,000 deaths resulted from suicide. We cannot be silent. Abortion's another issue. Last year in Florida alone, our state reports that 68,217 abortions were performed. That's an uptick of 6,000 from the year before. And human trafficking whether it is labor, human trafficking, or sex trafficking, it is skyrocketing. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. Do you know the biggest sex trafficking day is two weeks away? The Super Bowl. The NFL Super Bowl is the heaviest sex traded day. And we haven't even got to the spiritual needs yet. People who are living separated from God, people without the gospel. We live in a world where millions of people have never heard the gospel. We live in a world where mil millions of people, they, they, they do not know what this is, a Bible that would be a foreign word, and let alone the words of truth and freedom that come from the Bible. Now is not the time to be silent. We are the light of the world. We are ambassadors for Christ. 
We are sent out in his name, with his power, with his wisdom, with his strength, and we must plead, be reconciled to God. Time is of the essence. It is urgent. And the second thing, time is in God's hands. Time's in God's hands. And I pray that at this point we find comfort in this. The book of Esther does not mention God by name at all. But Mordecai understands the sovereignty of God. Understands the sovereignty of God being over time and the times. Mordecai makes an appeal to Esther to use her position as queen as leverage for the king to change the edict. But he's not sure if she's going to do it because she's already told him, I can't go see the king. It could cost me my life. So yes, time is of the essence, but Mordecai gives us and Esther a truth claim that we should never doubt. We should never forget. We find it also in verse 14. He said to her, if you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. As desperate as the situation is at hand for the Jews, Mordecai's understanding of the sovereignty of God was that he, it was, he was firm and fixed on the idea. And so should we. We should be firm and fixed on the idea that God is sovereign over all of these things. And though our living conditions today, <clears throat> so sorrowful, so hurtful, we can certainly put our trust in the sovereignty of God. Like, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and our mission. Everything that has happened in the past, everything that is happening at this time, everything that is going to happen in the time to come, God, creator and sustainer, is in charge of that, including certain people, certain places, at certain times. Verse 14 ends with, who knows? Perhaps you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. Perhaps it's a great place to put a parenthesis and put your name there. Perhaps you are here for such a time to go to Royal Family Kids Camp. Perhaps you are here for such a time to go to Teen Reach Adventure Camp. Perhaps you are here for such a time to have the job that you have right now. Perhaps you are here for such a time to have the neighbor or neighbors that you have right now. Perhaps you are at the school where you are right now for such a time as this. Perhaps you have the hobbies that you have for such a time as this. Perhaps you play the sports that you play for such a time as this. Perhaps... We shop where we shop for such a time as this. And oh yeah, perhaps for such a time as this, God would actually have you load up everything you own and move to the other side of the world as well. Perhaps. Time is urgent. God is in charge. And I want to end with a third point that Esther's response is fabulous here in verses 15 to 17. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king even if it's against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had ordered him. You are going to have to read chapters 5 through 10 to find out the rest of the story. (laughs) I'm stopping here with the third point of application. It's this. The time is now for us to be praying and seeking God's will and God's blessing on the mission at hand. Esther's response teaches us a really, really valuable lesson, especially 
for all of those people who are just the go-fix-it people. Instead of just jumping right into the problem, right into being the problem solution, trying to fix everything right there, first she says, let us go seek God. Let us go seek his counsel. Let's go seek his blessing. Let's go seek his wisdom. And so I guess what I would say to us as we end is this. Would you consider seeking the face of God as to where your ministry of reconciliation should be? at camp or elsewhere for such a time as this. What is God saying to us? Let's pray. God, we want to adore you as being the Almighty Sovereign, perfect, glorious God. There is nothing that escapes your eye. There's, there, there's nothing that you haven't ever thought of. We thank you for Jesus the one hope for all that is broken. I thank you that you didn't leave us in a situation of brokenness with with no escape, with no solution. But that Jesus is the one who can reconcile. And Lord, it seems so daunting to think You have chosen, you have made it your will, your purpose to use us as your ambassadors. And Lord, would you allow us then to see that as as a privileged responsibility? Guard our hearts I guess I would say it, guard our hearts from the American dream. Guard us from thinking we are too busy to plead with others to reconcile to God. Guard our hearts from thinking somebody else will do it. That I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm I'm too physically enabled, that I'm whatever. Lord, would you work a miracle in our lives to see the ministry of reconciliation as a gift from you, and then by your grace, in your strength, in your mercy, in your might, enable us to plead the good news of the gospel with the people of this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So John 3.16 seems a wonderful ending. For God loved the world this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's good news.